The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I think my lifelong love of animals, from the hilarious platypus to the blotched blue tongue skink, has its origin spent in the hours watching Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. <laughs> For those of you not familiar with the show, it was a nature program, a precursor to today's Animal Planet channel. But from the savannas of Kenya to the Barrier Reef in Australia and the jungles of Borneo, I was fascinated as new creatures in their curious habitats appeared on our television screen, particularly the elephant seals of Argentina. That episode focused on a mother and her newborn seal pup. Soon after birthing her baby, the mother, now famished, abandons the pup on the shore so she could go feed in the rich waters off the coast. After feeding, she returned to a different part of the beach and began to call for her baby. Of course, other mothers had done the same thing, all returning about the same time. How in the world would each mother and baby find one another? So the camera follows the mother as she calls to her pup and listens for his response. Following each other's voices and scents, soon mother and pup were reunited. And the narrator explained that from the moment of birth, the sound and scent from the pup are imprinted in the mother's memory. And the same is true for each pup. You know, that's how it is with God. We are imprinted with the memory of God, and God is imprinted with the memory of us, and even if it takes a lifetime, we will find one another. We just heard this in another seaside encounter. As Jesus walks along the Sea of Galilee in Matthew's Gospel, this is the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And it begins 
With the birth of the community of followers, Jesus calls to join him. Matthew describes Jesus calling the first four of his disciples, all fisher folk. He calls to them, follow me, follow me and I will make you fish for people. Peter and his brother Andrew and the Zebedee boys, James and John. Now I confess that for years, and actually many sermons, I have struggled with the sights and the sounds of this seaside encounter. Mostly because I know what the humid days along the Gulf Coast do to a wide, smelly net filled with flopping mullet. Once pulled ashore and tossed on the sun-bleached dock, they twitch in the sun, gasping for a bit of air as the gulls and the pelicans swoop and dive with an eye for an easy breakfast. Do I want to catch people like fish? Do I want to be caught hook, line, and sinker or in a smelly waterlogged net? But then you see, I think it does help. It does help to revisit this scene from Matthew's Gospel. Jesus calls, follow me and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed Jesus. Peter, Andrew, James and John did not fall in line like robots or zombies stumbling behind Jesus as if they were brainwashed. Not brainwashed, rather they were compelled Compelled because even in the midst of their day-to-day -day lives, they had been wired, been waiting, perhaps without knowing, to hear his voice. They had been imprinted with God. Belonging to God is not a matter of going limp in God's arms. We are called by God and we have been imprinted to love, to serve, to heal, to forgive. We are called to imitate Christ and to make choices that resemble His. And notice too, please, notice too that God's imprint, Jesus' call, happens to fishermen squarely in the midst of what they already knew how to do. That's the power of God at work. The power of God, thanks be to God, the power of God is not dependent upon the credentials of those called. Take this passage, for instance. Most of us hear it, and if we can get past the smelly fish scales, start worrying about whether we have what it takes to be a disciple. Could you do it? If a clear call were to come to you this afternoon, could you get up from your chair, walk out the door without taking your keys or turning off the lights? Could you abandon your grocery cart right in front of the frozen food case at Ingalls and set off for parts unknown without stopping to call home? That is more or less what those first four did. Someone and as far as we know, someone they had never seen before, someone said, follow me. And they did. Leaving their families, their jobs, their homes behind in order to go with him. Now, it was just not the way things were done in those days. Rabbis did not seek students. Rather, students sought them. Teachers waited for people to come to them and they interviewed them very carefully before deciding whether to take them on as disciples. And only the most promising students were allowed to stay on, the ones who showed real aptitude for theology. No self-respecting rabbi would ever have gone out to recruit his own followers. And if he had, he wouldn't have picked the first four he happened to lay eyes upon. <laughs> But, but by doing just that, 
Jesus set himself apart from the other teachers of his time. He alone walked out among the ordinary working people and chose them without a single question. Chose them to be his friends. It is so easy, I think, too easy sometimes, to get ourselves all wrapped up, not unlike fresh fish and newspaper, come to think of it, <laughs> to get ourselves all wrapped up in the what-ifs of this story. What if I heard and didn't follow? Or what if I didn't want to fish for people? Or what if I don't have what it takes? But my brothers and sisters, this powerful story is not about us. In this glorious season of Epiphany, we are reminded in every gospel every Sunday of the power of God, the power of God to birth love in this world. Even when we are odiferous or tired or uncertain. Because the story, our story, is God's story. God who has eternally imprinted us with God's love and power. Sometimes, following may mean staying at home. It may mean letting the hired servants go and taking care of Zebedee when he gets too old to fish. And sometimes following may mean casting the same old nets in a new way or for new reasons. It may mean doing something different with the fish you catch or spending the money they bring in at the market in a new way. It may mean reorganizing the whole fishing business so that the drifters down at the pier have work to do and so that everyone, everyone who works receives a decent wage. It may mean doing less every day, not more. So there is time to watch how the light changes on the water and how the happy fish leap out of it at dusk, happy to have outsmarted you one more time. The possibilities for following are endless. Sometimes they will be big, and sometimes they will be too small to mention, but it would be a mistake to focus too hard on our own abilities to follow. Nelson Mandela often quoted Marianne Robinson's following thoughts. I think it's a beautiful lens, a fisheye actually, on today's passage. Our deepest fear, she writes, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God, and your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us. It is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. So my sisters and my brothers, let's go fishing. Amen.